Let's see if the Lord will bless us again tonight in our studies in theology. If the doctrine of God's transcendence focuses on the three concepts of authority and superiority and mysteriousness, then I've said that eminence focuses on the three concepts of awareness, concern, and activity. And to, to shorten both of those, to make them more brief, if transcendence is best summed up under the notion of distinction, Remember the definition of transcendence. It refers to the relational status of God by which he is distinct from his creation. Well, if transcendence can be summed up under the notion of distinction, then eminence is best summed up under the idea of personal involvement. So how about a definition to go on your definition sheet and in your notes as well? Divine eminence refers to that relational status of God by which he is personally involved with his creation. You could have written that out yourself of what I've said thus far tonight and knowing already the definition that you have for transcendence. Eminence refers to the relational status of God by which he is personally involved with his creation there's at least one point at which eminence differs from omnipresence, another attribute of God. Omnipresence expresses the fact that God is personally present at all times and all places. Eminence says that he is personally involved. It has a little bit different meaning. Well, probably a major difference in the meaning. Not just is he present, but not just is he there, but he's working. He is involved. A scripture for this to begin with, Acts 17, 27 to 28. So turn there. Paul preaching on um, the hill at Athens, talking to the heathen, the unbelievers there, who know little about God, little about the truth, nothing about the Old Testament. And as a result, he doesn't refer to the Old Testament. When he's in a synagogue, he's quoting the law, Moses, the prophets. But Paul knew how to adjust himself to different circumstances. He said, with the Jew, I'm a Jew. With the Gentile, I'm a Gentile. With one under the law, I'm under the law. With one not under the law, I'm not under the law. 1 Corinthians 9, although he did add in parenthetically, I'm not without the law of Christ. He's not just a renegade, a heathen with a heathen. But he knows how to adapt himself. There are no Old Testament quotations here, but... He speaks on concepts of transcendence and eminence. He speaks on things about nature. Um, he speaks on the sense of deity. He speaks on things that evidently were some type of common ground between himself and the heathen. Although he's a believer, a Christian, elect, a Jew at that who knows the Old Testament, and they were none of those things. Well, at least a couple were elect. Dionysius, the Areopagite, Damaris, and a few others. We don't know how many, but not that many were elect. But they didn't have the other things with Paul, and yet there was some common ground between the two. Paul says in verse 27 of this chapter that they should seek the Lord. Now he's talking about all nations of men, verse 26. So we know he's talking about the heathen. That they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him. Now he's just speaking from their perspective. He's not giving them a Christian teaching from an apostle on the doctrine of special grace and on the doctrine of the special call, the effectual call. He can't get into all of that. He presents it from their side that if happen, that is if perchance they might feel after him. He's speaking as you'd have to speak to a heathen. He couldn't talk about election and sovereignty and that'd be beyond their understanding. But they know what it means to kind of grope and grasp after the gods up there. So he said that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him. And here's his comment on eminence, though he be not far from every one of us. <laughs> it's kind of like he says that with a smile because he knows how much they have labored. He just witnessed, remember, their altar to the unknown God. He knows how much they have labored after trying to find God. So much so that they thought if we don't have all the God's satisfied, pacified, appeased by our various altars to them, in case perchance we've missed one, then we just say, this is an altar to the unknown God. That makes sure we covered all the gods there could be. So Paul has to kind of say an irony, but yet it's the truth. He said he's not very far from every one of them. That is, from any of us, he's not very far. 
or of course that is an understatement. Not only is he not very far, well he goes on to say, for in him we live and move and have our being. The end of verse 27 is like a pun, it's irony, it's an understatement. Though he be not far from every one of us, for in him, in him, now how much closer can you get to God than being in him in this way? In him we live and move and have our being. He gives us the very spirit of life. Right. He gives us the very spirit of life. We live because we live in him. In that sense that he is our creator and we are our origin and our sustenance, our life to him right now. Amen. So eminence refers to the relational status of God by which he is personally involved with his creation. Now that's his creation, all of us. As certain also of your own poets have said. Now he would quote the prophets to the Jews in the synagogues and the poets to the heathens at Athens. Your own poets, he's quoting Eretus, for we are also his offspring. So he goes on to use his common sense and rationale to say to them, now if we're God's offspring, you know what you are, you're not made out of either stone or wood or gold or silver, then how could you picture God like that? For as much sin as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like in a gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. Because how could we be like God? How could your poet be telling the truth here? Paul knew that the poet was telling the truth. We are God's offspring. Offspring not in the sense of his children. Paul would deny that. But offspring in the sense that we owe our origin to God. Even the heathen owes his origin to God. So that includes all of us. But tonight we're going to do something different with divine eminence. We're going to talk about it in what might be called the doctrine of special eminence, which could also be referred to as covenant solidarity because the scriptures clearly teach that this divine eminence differs depending upon its object. That is to say, for instance, more secondary causes are used in God's activity in nature than, say, when compared with man. And another, for instance, his presence with his people is more positive and direct than humanity in general. There's eminence in the whole world. God is equally near everything in the world, but in a sense of not just nearness, locationally speaking, but positive, direct, personal involvement, then he uses, let's say, more secondary causes in nature, secondary causes in nature, quote unquote, than compared with man. I mean, obviously he does. And his presence with his people is, is more precise and more known and realized, more positive and more direct. Than, his, than is his presence with humanity in general. So let me start with a few scriptures in general, in the Old Testament, the book of Psalms, which teach eminence in differing degrees with different purposes because the subjects, or the, rather the objects, are different. In Psalm 145, verses 14 through 21, It's like one of the nature psalms, like the 104th psalm. I think I might have quoted from that last time. This is Psalm 145, verses 14 through the end of the chapter. Well, see, these are just some general passages in the Old Testament that teach the eminence of God. They teach it in different respects with different purposes because there are differing objects. The Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. The eye, and notice how it's so all-inclusive through the, this passage. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat or their food in due season. We saw last time from the 104th Psalm that the young lions roar and seek their prey from God. Now the psalmist isn't, well, he's just speaking anthropomorphically. He's not ascribing some human intelligence or something to the lions, but he's trying to give us a little more intelligence than some people have, they think that, well, the lions are just out there, and they don't know, as Jesus said, that your heavenly Father feedeth them. Thou openest thine hand and satisfieth the desire of every living thing. When God closes his hand, we call that death. The trees die, the plants die, animals die, men die. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him. Now he's getting a little more precise here. To all that call upon him in truth. 
He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Amen. And then in Psalm 34, verses 15 and 16, it's a contrast between the righteous and the wicked. The eyes of the Lord are upon and his ears are open to, they're attuned to the prayers of the righteous. Verse 15, but his face is against the wicked to cut them off. Psalm 34, 15, and 16. So the scriptures say that he is present both to bless and to curse, depending on the object. And I've said that's one reason why people don't like some of these concepts we're studying, because if you can keep God as a principle, and an abstract one at that, then an abstract principle has neither the power to bless nor to curse. And it's that latter thing that people are more afraid of. It's this notion of being cursed by this divine being. This latter notion is why many people do not want to believe in divine eminence. They'd rather make God extremely transcendent so he's not down here to do anything about their deeds. But you know, since we're the people of God, his own elect children, his bride, his living temple, we want to focus tonight in this study on his eminence with the saved or his eminence with the elect. We're going to do a study in the Old and the New Testament for the nation of Israel and for the church of Jesus as well. Divine eminence, I've entitled this, and covenant solidarity. God's eminence differs in its precision or its, in its positive directness. It differs in that depending on the object. So we might call this a doctrine of God's special eminence. He is personally involved in all of creation out there with all of the heathen. With the Hitlers, the Mussolini, he's personally involved. Now, he might not be personally involved to bless, or not to bless always, but he's personally involved with that man. He was with that man and with his life. Now, there were things that God did that were good. He gave him rain and allowed him to wake up in the morning and blink his eyes and take a breath and live. But, of course, the end of that man was death and misery and destruction. But God is still personally involved. But we don't want that for ourselves, not the death and misery and destruction. God is personally present with the elect. We're talking that, from, we're saying that from God's side. The elect, God knows who the elect are. And we know if we are. You don't necessarily know if someone else is, but you know if you are. If you're elect, then God is personally present with you in an unusual way. In a way in which he is not present with the world. Because he's present to bless and to direct, to encourage, to instruct, to guide. Amen. And not to cast stumbling blocks before you as he does the wicked. Amen. He allows them to devise all of these ingenious snares, and then he ensures the fact they fall into their own snares. But he delivers us out of the snare of the fowler. Amen. So for God's chosen people, eminence is more than just involvement. It's more than just personal involvement. I had to leave that in the definition because the definition is not one of special eminence, it's just one of eminence, which includes all of us, from crickets to... Christians. God is personally involved with his creation. But when we're talking about God's chosen people, then eminence is more than just involvement. If I could build another little triplet for identification, it's more than just involvement. It is relationship, togetherness, and identification. Relationship, togetherness. Now, God's not together. He might be personally involved with the heathen, but we couldn't say he's together with them. And he doesn't have a relationship with them either. A relationship is something that's spiritual and eternal. Relationship, togetherness, and identification. We know that in the incarnation of Jesus, he came to identify with us in our life and our struggles so that as he died on the cross, we could identify with him in his death. Paul talks of it all as being accomplished in us and all being past tense. For we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So God's eminence is covenant solidarity. Now that's a good word that has made the media in the last decade from Poland, solidarity. But it's a good word, solidarity. It speaks of identification. Covenant solidarity. God is the one who elects, he saves, he blesses, and he preserves unto the very end his people. 
Nothing can stop that. Nothing can thwart God's purpose with the elect. And as Jesus taught us in John 10, no one, nothing can snatch you out of the Father's hand. All of this is the work of God from start to finish. He elects, he saves, he blesses, and he preserves. See, that goes through our whole bit. That elect from the foundation of the world. Then there is a time in our life when he saves us. Then throughout our Christian life, he blesses us. All the way to the end, he preserves us until time is no more. And nothing can stop that. That's divine, that's divine special eminence on our behalf. God is with us. He identifies with us. He has a relationship with us. And he is together with us. What we're in, he's in with us. And what he has, we have with him. He identifies with us as the God-man Jesus Christ in our struggles and problems so that he can be a faithful and merciful high priest in things pertaining to God. The writer of Hebrews, the second chapter, tells us to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. That's the one side. And the other side, that's what he has shared with us. The other side is he said, now I, I have invited you to share all of my glory and to share all of my riches with you. That's the divine exchange there. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's the divine exchange. We exchanged our sins, our corruption, our misery, our problems for all of the glory of heaven. Glory in this life and glory to come as well. Well, that's a fairly good exchange, I would say. Amen. Amen. Paul says that we are joint heirs with the Son, Jesus Christ. We are joint heirs with him. Romans chapter 8. Paul sees all of this as being done. It's settled as far as he is concerned. Our election, our salvation, our blessing, and our preservation. You know, many of the metaphors in Scripture depict this state of togetherness or relationship or closeness. The bride and the bridegroom. All of these metaphors depict this. The vine and the branches. The vineyard and the vine dresser. The shepherd and the sheep the cornerstone and the lively stones, the father and the son. God is our father. We are his sons and daughters. The potter and the clay. All of these various metaphors and many more you could think of in the Old and the New Testament, some better known, some lesser known, depict the fact that there is this relationship and a special sense that God has, a closeness, a togetherness, an identification, and a special sense that he has with us that he does not have with the rest of his creation. For instance, he's so close to us that in the Old Testament and in the New, he names his name upon us. Now, that was very important. He names his name upon us. For instance, in the Old Testament, God was what? He was the God of Israel. He was the God of Israel. And even the name Israel has the name of God in it, E-L, attached to the end of it. We know that the disciples in Acts 11 were first called Christians at Antioch, and although that name was given to them by the heathen, that also was through the providence of God. Because Peter speaks of Christians over in his epistles in 1 Peter 5, if any man suffer as a Christian, then so forth. He adopts the name as well. It's interesting that God worked that out in such a way that we have the very name of God, Jesus Christ, named upon us. Now, we know a lot of people call themselves that, and they aren't, but... At least some of us call ourselves that, and we are. And that's what's important. That's what is a blessing. Some of us call ourselves Christians, and some of us actually are. Not everyone is who calls himself that, but at least God has allowed us to have his name named upon us. So this is like relational eminence or covenant solidarity. I quoted a passage to you last time. You may want to look at again as far as identification is concerned. In Isaiah chapter 63, we are so closely related, and it's all by God's own choice. It's by grace you are saved through faith, and that's not of yourselves. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Because Paul knows that's what man would do. He'd find some way or the other to boast about it. We are so closely related, I was saying, by his choice that if Isaiah 63, 9 means anything, it means that when we are pained, then he is pained. 
You can find other scriptures that would teach this, but this is probably the clearest one in the Bible. Isaiah 63, 9. He's looking back on all the struggles that the nation of Israel has gone through. And the prophet writes, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. Now, you can only make a statement like that if there is some extremely close relationship and togetherness and identification going on. He identified with them in the struggles and problems and miseries through which they went. Even when their struggles, difficulties, problems, and miseries were occasioned by their own disobedience. And I'll give you some scriptures that will prove that in a moment. If they are God's elect. Now, not all Israel was Israel. Remember, as Paul said in Romans chapter 11. Not, not all who, not every man who was a Jew was truly a Jew in the sense in which Paul was meaning that he was an elect member of God's kingdom. Now, some were. Moses was, Caleb was, Joshua was, Korah wasn't. He was a Jew, but not an elect one, though. God elected the whole nation as a nation. He elected that nation from among others. But within the nation, he didn't elect every single person there. He elected certain special people. You say special, well, of course, his election made them special. It wasn't because they were special. His election made them that. Amen. So we're talking about those who are elect. And now I'm saying that even when their miseries and their defeats and their captivities were occasioned by their own sins, God still said, in your affliction, I was afflicted. Now, for the heathen out there, he just lets them go. But for his people, and we say, well, what if they didn't do anything wrong? We would know that he identifies with them. But even in their sin, he identifies in the sense that when they are afflicted, he is afflicted. Whenever they're down in Egypt, he is pained because they are pained. We read that in the end of Exodus chapter 2. They began to cry out to God and groan because of their misery, and this cry came up to God because of their bondage. And God remembered the covenant that he made with Abraham, and he looked favorably upon them. That's the Hebrew use of remember anthropomorphically. God doesn't ever forget anything. But it's remember in the sense that now he's going to actively set into motion a plan to do something about their Egyptian slavery. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. That's speaking of God's patience with the nation of Israel all through those years. Think of the wilderness wandering years, 40 years wandering, or 38 to be exact, 38 years wandering in the desert. And we know that because of the complaint that came from their mouth, Many, many thousands of them perished in the wilderness. Their carcasses fell there, as God said would happen. But with those who were elect, they had to endure the rigors that everyone else had to endure. With supernatural provision, but still rigors of a desert life, of the life of a nomad. And they were headed to a land where, well, as God said in Deuteronomy 8, I'm going to give it to you. You're going to have wells that you didn't dig, and vineyards that you didn't plant, and houses that you didn't build, and animals that you didn't have to raise. It's all going to be given to you. It'll all be yours. But they had to go through all that experience, and God said, whenever they were afflicted, I was afflicted. Now, he says the same thing about us. Whenever we are pained about something, then God is pained. This is Hebrews 4. We don't have such a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our weaknesses. We don't have that type of high priest who cannot be touched. In other words, we do have one who can be touched with our weaknesses, with the feelings of our afflictions and our miseries and our pains. He can be touched by them. The scriptures say that whenever we backslide, the elect, we're not talking about the non, they couldn't backslide. They've not gotten up to a place from which they could slide. But the elect, when they backslide, and they do, on occasion, he yearns for their restoration. Let's look at a couple of scriptures here. Jeremiah 31, 20. This is divine eminence and covenant solidarity. God will not forsake us. He's chosen us. We are like a signet upon his hand, and he will not cast us off. So, but of course, when we backslide, there is a problem. God has to find a way to deal with that, and he does. He deals with it through chastisement. But through it all, he yearns for our restoration. He does not forsake us. Look at Jeremiah 31. I'll give you two passages you probably have never even... Well, I know you've read them because you've read all the way through your Bible, haven't you? All right, but these are ones that you didn't even know were there until they just pop up like this. And how many thousands of those are there? For all of us, myself included. 
maybe not that many in the New Testament, but a whole lot of in the Old. You'll find verses hidden in Isaiah that you never knew were there. Until you need them for a certain doctrine or point or proof. Until God ministers it to you. Jeremiah 31, 20. Now, you know, Ephraim is like a prophetic name for the nation, Israel. Ephraim was a very, very large tribe. And especially in Hosea's prophecy, and by the way, it's to that prophecy we'll turn here next. But in Hosea's prophecy, Ephraim just becomes a synonym for the nation. Is Ephraim, is Ephraim my dear son? Well, is he? Well, of course he is, by God's own election. He made a covenant with Abraham that he will not forget. Is he a pleasant child? For since I spake against him, that is, through the warnings of the prophets, God prophesied warnings of destruction and captivity. For since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. You see, we have to remember that as we read through all of these horrible prophecies given over the nation by Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, and right through the minor prophets. God said, ever since I've spoken against him, it doesn't mean that I've forgotten him, I'm still yearning upon him. Therefore, my bowels, that is again just a figurative reference for the, the, the inner thoughts and inner emotions and compassions of God. My bowels are trouble for him. So he decides what he will do. I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. Even though he spoke against him, even though Ephraim deserved to be spoken against, God said, I can't forget him. He's my son, he's my child, he's my dear son and my pleasant child. And I will surely have mercy upon him. And look over in Hosea's prophecy. Now Hosea, I think this is 11, chapter 11. Hosea has a real interesting revelation of well, again, it's anthropomorphically, but of contrary emotions that are fighting at one another in the breast of God. Now, he's speaking as though a man would speak. God knows the end from the beginning and has it planned out, but we can't understand all this unless he speaks to us as though we are children, and in fact, we are. Now, Israel has sinned, so what should you do? Well, what would, what would you do if your son or your daughter sinned? You should punish them. And yet your love, your, your righteousness tells you I have to punish. But your love says, but, but I've got to find a way, I've got to find a way to keep them with me though. They have to be punished, but yet I can't forsake them. So we go through this as parents, our love and our, quote, righteousness, or our love and our holiness, or our love and our anger, or our love and our displeasure wrestling with each other. And it's like you have a court scene in your own heart. Now, you want to discipline your child, but yet you love them and you hate to discipline them. And yet you know that you have to, and yet you hate to, and yet you know that you have to, and yet you hate to. Amen. And so it's wrestling back and forth. And so what should I do? Well, what triumphs in the end is the love of God. God does discipline them in measure. He said, you've sinned, I'll discipline you in measure. But what triumphs in the end is not discipline, period, because what would come after that? Well, nothing if there's a period. What triumphs in the end is God's love. Look at this in Hosea 11. 7 through 9. And my people are bent on backsliding. Well, that's surely true of the poor nation of Israel. My people are bent to backsliding from me. Though they call them to the Most High, none at all would exalt him. Though the prophets had given a word, still they wouldn't come. Now, now watch all of these questions. Now this is God asking the question. You study out, well, I don't want to get into that here. Maybe I better just drop that and stay here. But God asks himself a series of questions. He's talking to himself. Now, he knows the answer. But this is a revelation of his character and of his love and concern for us. But it's like what happened with the death of Christ at Calvary. You know, God has to find a way to deal with our sins, and yet God loves us, the elect, that he's loved from the foundation of the world. Before we even had any existence, God loved us and knew us, foreknew us. Yet he doesn't want to cast us off. And so they're struggling this, and it's in an anthropomorphic sense, this battle between God's righteousness and between his love. Paul talks about the fact in Romans chapter 3, and of course the only remedy is the cross of Christ because God cannot just ignore sin. He couldn't do that and remain true to himself. Sin has to be dealt with. But if he dealt with it, dealt with it in us, in, in the sense in which it needed to be, then none could stand before God. 
As the psalmist said, if God dealt with us after our sins, not remembering, rather as he does, that we are but flesh and grass, no one would remain. No one could stand before God. And yet he wants us to remain. So what can he do? Just forget about our sins? He can't do that either. So he deals with them in his son Jesus, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Romans chapter 3. He's still just and righteous and true to his own causes and to his own character of holiness and righteousness. He's still just. He's still true to that. But he might be just and the justifier. And he can still save us. Now that was the problem, quote unquote, posed in the divine mind. How he could save us and still be just. Because the only way we could think of is, well, you have to give up one or the other. You either can't save us or you can't remain just. And God found a way to deal with it by punishing our sins in Christ. They were laid upon him as the, um, our iniquities were laid upon him as the prophet Isaiah said, Isaiah 53, 6. So back to our passage again. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Adma? How shall I set thee as Zeboim, two sister cities of Sodom and Gomorrah? Read Genesis 14. My heart is turned within me. People wonder, people talk about, does God have any passions or emotions at all? Well, some of your orthodox conservative theologians, because they have a certain type of scholastic attitude toward God, they say God is immovable. That is, he has no passion. Passion in the sense of emotion. God has no emotion. Well, the scriptures say that he does. Of course, they would say, well, all this is is anthropomorphic. It's just that. And it's just speaking as though a man. Then you're saying that we serve a God who has zero emotion. Zero. Well, we're made in his own image, though. And emotion is a part of character and personality. If you don't have that, you don't have person. You have rock or anchor or boat. God says, mine heart is turned within me. My repentings are kindled together. I, and here's his conclusion now. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim. Can you see that he's struggling with the picture? Should I destroy them or not? I don't want to because I love them, but I need to because they've sinned against me. And he said, here's the conclusion. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger, and I will not return to destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not man. Only God could have that type of forgiveness in him. The Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into the city. That is, enter into it in destruction. So I'm saying, with God's identification, that even when we backslide, he yearns for our restoration. The identification is so close that to resist God's people is to resist God himself. A few scriptures on that. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3a. You know, where God is giving this blessing upon Abraham. He said, I'm going to make you a blessing, verse 2. And I will, 3a, bless them that bless you and curse him that curseth you. He's so identified with Abraham. He said, I'll bless them. Genesis 12, 3a. I'll bless them that bless you and I'll curse him who curses you. Skipping all the way to the end of the Old Testament in Zechariah 2.8, he said, He that toucheth you toucheth the pupil of mine eye. To touch Israel is to touch God. Which will lead us to a point here in a moment. That's why God fought their battles for them because when people attacked Israel, they weren't really attacking Israel. They're attacking God. They're attacking all that Israel stands for. And that was the true and living God as opposed to all of the deaf and dumb idols of the heathen. In Exodus 16, 8, the people began to complain and murmur against Moses. No, Moses said, your murmurings aren't against me. They're against the Lord. To murmur against God's prophet is to murmur against God. And God sent them a loathsome disease because of that. In Psalm 105, verses 14 and 15, this concerns the whole nation. He said that he rebuked kings for their sake, saying, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. Psalm 105, 14 and 15. He reproved kings for their sake. Now, you think of that, reproved kings, because who are they? They're nothing but a group of runaway slaves. And God esteemed them more highly than he did all the pagan heathen kings. And so he rebuked kings for their sake. 
What are some examples of that? Well, remember Abraham and Abimelech in Genesis chapter 20? Abimelech took Abraham's wife, sister, thinking it was only sister and not half-sister who was his wife, married to him. And God appeared to Abimelech in a dream by night and said, Abimelech, thou art a dead man for the woman that you have, for she is another man's wife. He rebuked a king for Abraham's sake. Now, Abraham really didn't do the right thing. He should have told the whole truth, but he didn't tell the whole truth out of fear. He told part of it, but the part he told concealed the truth, which ended up making it a lie as far as Abraham and Abimelech were concerned. And even in his sin or backsliding, God still rebuked kings for his sake. That's good. That's a good deal, a good bargain when you have God on your side. He rebukes kings for your sake. Acts 9, 4, I gave you this last time. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou the Christian church? No. What does it say? Why do you persecute me? Well, Jesus was in heaven. You couldn't persecute him. Well, to touch his people is to touch him. Whoever touches the Christian church touches the pupil of God's eye. And they dare not do that. You see, and this is why we're often told in the Old Testament, especially, that the Lord will fight for his people. Now, these are encouraging passages, but I don't think I'll take the time to look all of them up. But we're often told, because of this identification, it's all through God's grace and his special eminence that he's with the people in relationship and togetherness, that when they fight Israel, they're fighting what Israel stands for. And they are nothing. I mean, Abraham was a pagan taken from the other side of the river, Ur of the Chaldees, brought over, given the revelation of the true and living God. He wasn't looking for it or seeking for it. He was given it by special grace. So who are they? They're not anybody. Who's Abraham? Now they've become somebody because of what God has done for them. Who's Isaac? Who's Jacob? Who's Judah? Who's Joseph? They're nobody. They would have, I mean, had God not blessed them as he did and, we, and, and ensured their posterity with us today and a revelation of their history in this book, well, those names would just pass back into oblivion. We still remember Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar, but you wouldn't remember Isaiah or Jeremiah or Amos of the herdsmen of Tekoa, the little part, you wouldn't remember Amos at all. He would have been long gone forgotten. But because God said, they're not going to forget you. You've given a word that's an everlasting word. We still remember those people today. But it's because God is on their side. So take these passages. God's fighting on their behalf because the pagan are fighting him. Exodus 14, 13 to 14. Here Moses says, stand still, hold your peace, and the Lord will fight your battles. And verse 25, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 30, chapter 3, verse 22, chapter 20, verse 4, Joshua 10, verses 14 and 42, and Joshua 23, verses 3 and 10. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 15 and 29. And let's see, I just read something today. Second Chronicles, let me get the chapter. Hezekiah, remember? The Assyrians have surrounded the city. <clears throat> they said, don't listen to Hezekiah, giving you all that stuff about God and religion and faith and God's going to protect you. Well, have, has God worked for any of the other nations? <laughs> of course, what... Those heathen didn't know is that they'd never faced a true and living God yet. This was their first time they ever faced a true and living God. And old Hezekiah said in verse 7 of 2 Chronicles 32, Be strong and courageous, be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. Look at verse 7, For there be more with us than with him. <laughs> well, Technically not. You count the numbers. And if, even if you counted all of them, you'd have to count the old women and babies. And they were all locked up, as the king said, like a bird in a cage in the city of Jerusalem. But he says in verse 8, God's on our side. With him is an arm of flesh. Good old Jeremiah 17, 5 reference. The arm of flesh. Cursed is a man who makes flesh his arm. With him is an arm of flesh. In other words, all he has is just men to fight. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. So they rested themselves on the words that they had heard. And you could find other ones like 
Elisha in 2 Kings 6 and so forth. God is going to fight. Or how about Zechariah chapter 14, verse 3? Now, this is just about the last battle. Well, there'll be one more when God overthrows the devil, but this is just about the last battle here. Zechariah chapter 14. And this is an interesting passage because, well, because of many reasons. Because it's in the Bible, that's one reason it's interesting. Anything in the Word is interesting. Because it has to do with end times, and we're studying a lot about that, makes it very interesting. And thirdly, because it looks back on all these verses we've just been giving you. Zechariah 14. This is an interesting way where you find the Old Testament, a passage in it, actually looking back on earlier history. Again, recorded in the same book, the Old Testament. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Now, this is a prophecy to the city to begin with. Thy spoil is the spoil of the city. I will gather all nations. God said he'll do it, so he's the one who does it, but he does it so he can chastise Israel and then judge the nations. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken. That means Jerusalem actually does fall in so-called battle of Armageddon. It does fall. The city shall be taken. A lot of people don't know that verse is there. And the houses rifled and the women ravished and half of the city shall go forth into captivity. Well, that sounds like the battle is already over with. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Look at verse 3. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Now, the day of battle would be like the exodus like uh, Jehoshaphat in Second Chronicles chapter 20, like Hezekiah in chapter 32, as in the day, then will the Lord go forth. This will be the Lord as the Lord fought for them then. It was the Lord Jesus Christ who fought for them. Then will the Lord go forth and fight for them against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And of course, where we find a picture of that is over in Revelation chapter uh, 19. Revelation chapter 19 we're already told there in Zechariah 14, they're gathered together to fight against Jerusalem. He gathered all nations to fight against Jerusalem, Zechariah 14 too. So that's where the battle is. That's how we know where it is. And then we come to Revelation 19, 14, the armies which were in heaven followed him, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And that he should rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Uh, verse 19, And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him. Well, now remember, they're making war against the city, but to fight against the city is to fight against the one who comes to rescue the city after its fall. That sat on the ho horse and against his army. The beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. There's another reference, by the way, where the mark and the worshipping always go together in Revelation. And these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword. And who did the slaying? Of him that sat upon the horse, Jesus Christ. Then will he go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Zechariah 14.3. Or note another passage. There are just so many of these. Isaiah chapter 31, verses 4 through 5. Isaiah 31, 4 through 5. See, we take these doctrinal truths that are such and we show how they are that a doctrinal truth and how they have relevance or application to us. Isaiah 31, 4. For thus, saith the, for thus hath the Lord spoken unto me, like as the lion and the young lion roaring on his prey when a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice nor abase himself for the noise of them. In other words, a lion's not going to run just because a whole group of shepherds come and tries to deliver a sheep out of his mouth, and so it will be with the Lord. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion and for the hill thereof. And as birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also, he will deliver it, and passing over, he will preserve it. 
that's the verse that's going to find absolute, ultimate fulfillment in the end times. Defending, he will deliver. Passing over, he will preserve. It's a well-known verse. It's easy to remember because of the double Ds and double Ps. Defending, he will deliver. And passing over, he will preserve. Let's go to the New Testament in our mind. In the New Testament, I mean, if that's true in the Old, don't you think he'd also fight against the enemies of the church? Well, surely he did. Let's look at some various ways in which he did that. In Acts 2, this is a unique way. He simply gave the church favor with all the people. <laughs> well, that's a good way to overcome your enemies. Proverbs 16 said that if a man serves the Lord, he'll make him be at peace even with his enemies. Acts 2, Acts 5 Here's another way how he fought against them. He sent an angel and delivered the apostles from prison early in the morning and said, go stand in the temple and teach the people all the words of this life. In Acts 12, now this was a great persecutor of the church, Herod. He had actually killed one of the Lord's apostles with the sword, imprisoned Peter, intending on doing the same. Well, an angel was sent and rescued Peter. Peter thought he was beside himself, but then he knew when he came to himself that God had sent his angel and delivered me from all of the expectation of Herod and the people. And that's not the end of Acts 12. God finally just took care of that king whenever he gave an oration and the people said, it's a God, not a man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord smote him with worms and he gave up the spirit. He was eaten of worms and gave up the spirit. God fought for the church. God fought for the church. Or here's probably the most unique way in the New Testament that he ever fought for the church, and this is recorded for us in Acts 9. How did he fight against the church's enemies? By saving the worst of the bunch. <laughs> All you got to do is save them, and that delivers the church. Delivered them from who? From Saul, their art persecutor. So the principle is Romans 12, 19. Give place unto wrath, for vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. We don't fight our battles. God does. He said, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And give place unto wrath, because God hath said, vengeance belongeth unto me, I will repay. I'm reminded of another series of accounts. Do you remember whenever Israel did come out of Egypt? They went through the desert. They're making their first attempt or assault on the promised land. It doesn't really work out because they find when they get there, they've got giants there, and they end up entering into fear, and they have to go back and learn that lesson all over again. But on the way there, they want to go into, just pass through the land of like the Edomites because Esau and Jacob, they should be related from their past history. And remember, they sent some kings and some warriors out and said, get out of here. We don't. They said, just let us, we won't even touch anything. Just let us walk through your land. They said, no, out. And God said, they're your brothers. Don't harm them. You go on around them. In other words, live peaceably with them. But you know, later on, God dealt with those Edomites, the descendants of Esau. He dealt with them in war whenever the other nations and the nation of Israel itself began to war against them later in Israel's history and defeated the Edomites. So there again was a time where God said, live peaceably with them right now. Don't go through their land. Go another way. They're your brothers. But eventually God judged that group of that nation, that group of people, because of their uh, obstinate heart against allowing Israel to pass through. So God is with us and God is near his people. In Deuteronomy 4 and verse 7, I know this is just a kind of a litany of verses here. I hope it makes some sense to you. Moses rhapsodizes here in, in such an interesting way. Chapter 4 of Deuteronomy in verse 7 in saying this, For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? Deuteronomy 4, 7. Moses is like astounded over this. What nation is there that has God so near to them? That proves there's a difference between eminence in general and special eminence. Because he is near all, to all. In him we live and move and have our being. But he asks the question, what, what nation is there on earth that has God so nigh unto them as we have him unto us in all things that we call upon him for? Well, there is no nation like Israel. God was near to that nation. Well, now it's not a nation of people, but it is individuals that make up the Christian church. And God, so with them, with us. 
is nearer to us, is nearer to us than to any other people. You can see the same in chapter 30 of Deuteronomy, verses 11 through 14. Paul quotes that in Romans 10 when he talks about the word. Is it up in heaven? Is it across the sea? Is it down deep in the earth so you have to go down and get it? He said it's near you, it's nigh you, it's even in your heart and in your mouth. It's near to you. Or take God's tender concern over us seen in Isaiah 49, 15. Isaiah 49, 15. Now I'll read part of this verse and we'll give what we would think would be the standard answer. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Can a woman forget a son? We'd say, well, no, she couldn't. Well, yeah, there are a few possible rare exceptions where, strange as it may seem, sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. She may, she might. There are a whole lot of women who are murdering their children before they're born today. So this scripture really has relevance for today. Can a woman forget her sucking child? You say, well, Isaiah, that's nothing. You ought to ask it like this. Can she even give birth today but without murdering her own child? Yea, they may forget. Yet will I not forget thee. See, he took something that we could hardly even imagine. A mother forgetting her sucking child? Not a grown teenager, a nursing infant. Would a mother ever cast off an infant like that? I mean, that is something we can hardly even imagine would ever take place. And yet God said, well, yea, they may. Can a woman do that? Yes, they could. That's possible, and it does happen. But could I ever forget you? Never. Never. He gives us what we would think would be the strongest possible imaginable bond, a mother and a nursing infant. And yet, you know, we read it in the newspapers that women just give birth to a baby and then put them in a plastic bag and throw them in the dumpster. So, yes, that can happen. But will I forget you, God says? Never. I will never forget you. Amen. Amen. That's a blessed verse there. I will never forget you. This is covenant solidarity. God is with his people. Amen. Even in our sin, he said, I'm, I'm, my heart is striving with anywhere to, whether to punish you or to, to, to preserve you. And I've chosen to preserve you. I'm going to make sure that you are preserved. I find this also interesting in light of this study that his in the Old Testament, a prophetic name given to God, and it was so fulfilled in the birth of Jesus in Matthew 1, 23, was the name Emmanuel. And Matthew says, which being interpreted is God with us. Now that's eminence. That's with us. That's covenant solidarity. God with us. That's even the name that was given to Jesus. God with us. Matthew 1, 23. In the Old Testament, covenant solidarity is often expressed under terminology such as, you find this scores of times, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. That's divine special eminence there. He doesn't promise that to anyone else but the nation of Israel. I will be your God, and you will be my people. Or another way in which it is expressed is when God says that I will dwell and walk in the midst of Israel. Again, special divine eminence. Take, for instance, Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 12. Or again, our passage in Hosea, Hosea 11, 9. Or take something that is somewhat mystical, but it's true in the New Testament, and that's for us, the church, in Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5 and verse 30. He told them, I'll be your God, you'll be my people, I'll dwell and walk in the midst of you, but here's what we're told of us. It's a little more precise and dramatic. Ephesians 5.30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Well, he doesn't mean that in a literal sense. We don't share the same body and flesh and bones as Jesus did in his earthly body. But we are that close to him. We are one with him. Now to demonstrate... Let me give you some ways in which God has demonstrated. To demonstrate this gracious eminence to Israel, God actually drew near to them in a literal spatial sense. Now remember, eminence is a metaphor, a spatial metaphor, speaking of God being near us. But sometimes to demonstrate this, God literally, actually, drew near to them in a spatial sense. 
For instance, one of the most mighty occasions, memorable and earliest ones for the nation was in Exodus 19 when he drew near to the nation by descending on the top of Mount Sinai. And the mountain, the whole mountain was all together on a smoke, we're told. A trumpet was blasting loud, exceedingly loud, and it grew, it waxed louder and louder. In the pillar of cloud and fire that both followed and led them, God literally in a spatial sense drew near to the nation of Israel. In the tabernacle when it was built, God came down and dwelt. He said, my throne is upon the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant between the outstretched arms of the cherubim. Later, whenever the tabernacle was dismantled in the temple, Solomon's temple replaced it again. The fire of God came down. The presence of God, the glory of God came down. God came down. And the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud. Or take it in this most special sense imaginable in which God has literally drawn near to the nation of Israel. And that was in the incarnation of his son, Jesus Christ. We read of this in Matthew 1, 23. This isn't just the man, Jesus. According to prophecy, a virgin would conceive and give birth and they would name the child Emmanuel. God with us. Not God with us through the ministry of a prophet. This is God. This is God himself. God with us. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, speaking of the word of life, we've looked upon him, our eyes have seen him, we've handled him. You couldn't ask for any more real, literal, spatial sense of eminence than this. Or take John, again the same apostle, his gospel now. John 1.1 1, 1 tells us in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. So the word was God, it's Jesus Christ. The word is God. Then we read in John 1 and verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the word, and the word was made flesh and dwelt literally and tabernacled among us. There's probably, John probably intends some conscious association with God's presence in the Old Testament tabernacle. He didn't just say, and he dwelt among us, and he tabernacled among us. God in the body, and it was a real body, but in the body and the form of his son, Jesus Christ, literally, spatially, drew near to the nation of Israel. And he walked their streets, and he preached the word to them. And he was with the apostles, and they saw him. They touched him. They looked upon him. They felt his breath. They felt his flesh whenever he leaned upon them or whenever John reclined upon the Lord's breast. So he's not a God who's out there. He's a God who is here. In time, he's not a God who is then. He's a God who is now because of his eminence. Whenever the Israelites were tempted to wonder what happened to all of God's miracles like old Gideon was tempted to in Judges 6.13 and following. Then the angel of the Lord came down and reminded Gideon that God is as much the God of today as he is yesterday. And he is as much the God of forever as he is today. And that reminds us of Hebrews 13.8. Jesus Christ the same Yesterday, today, and forever. So, friends, let me conclude our study tonight with this. He is not only the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of the prophets, the God of Jesus Christ, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of the apostles, but he's your God too. That is amazing. That is amazing grace there. Now we can add some names to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you can put your name on there as well. It has a pretty good ring to it. Try it out. Hallelujah. Praise God. He's real.